Today's special remote episode of the BS Podcast is brought to you by Siki. That's our presenting sponsor. It's the late 70s time the best tickets for NHL playoffs round three, NBA playoffs round three, Hamilton, the opera. You name it. I have Siki on my phone. It's the easiest way to shop for the best tickets thanks to the revolutionary grading system. Buy and sell tickets in just two taps on your phone. Two taps. Everything fully guaranteed. Try it out. Download the Seeky app today or go right to Seeky.com. We're also brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. If you're choosing a mortgage lender, work with one that has your best interest in mind. Rocket Mortgage provides a transparent online process that helps you understand the details of your home loan, adjust the rate and length of your loan in real time to make sure you get the right mortgage that you lose your view, skip the bank, skip the waiting, go completely online at quickenloans.com slash Bill Simmons, equal housing lender. Licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. And finally, we are brought to you by Larry Wilmore's new podcast that is called Black on the Air and Cousin Sal's new podcast. That one's called Against All Odds. They launched in the last couple of weeks. If you love gambling, if you love Larry Wilmore, subscribe to both of them. And finally, the ringer.com. I have a new piece up there today, the Lottery Karma Rankings. We're about to talk, talk about them with uh, a distraught Joe House. But first, Pearl Jam. All right, it is 11 o'clock in the morning, East Coast time. I am in Boston, Massachusetts, Joe House in Washington, D.C. Sorry for the sound quality for this, but I wasn't positive for do a podcast, but Game 7 was fantastic. Uh, I don't know if House enjoyed it very much. We have not talked. We texted each other, saved it for the pod. Our teams have played in the playoff series. My team won Game 7, uh, and they won because of uh, a Canadian guy who looks like a and can speak extra named Kelly Olenek. How much do you hate Kelly Olenek, House? It's, a, it's an 11 out of 10. It is, as always, just dessert for the last time we connected and discussed Kelly Olenek. I um, was very vocal with my disrespect for his game. I have to tell you, my opinion hasn't really changed. He exceeded his point total for games four, five, and six with uh, his performance last night. And in many respects, he was just generic. He was generic Boston bench player number four. I mean, it, it was all, you know, it was, it was all in it, um, just because of, you know, karma biting uh, me and Washington in the ass for um, the extra vitriol that we directed at him through the course of hmm. this series. But, you know, he, it could have been Smart. It could have been Crowder. It could have been Rozier. I, it didn't really matter that it was Olenek other than the extra uh, sour cherry on top of the Sunday. Well, they left him open. I mean, part of the Wizards' game plan was we're just going to trap Isaiah at the top of the key, that midcourt, over and over and over again, make other guys beat us. And, you know, it was interesting. I don't know how it plays on TV, but in person, I really noticed it last night because, you know, I was there. I was sitting in great seats, sitting with my dad. My dad was a, a near heart attack the whole time. Um, but the movement that the Celtics had and how many backdoor layups they got, how many times they found open guys was all based on the fact that Washington wouldn't change how they're defending Isaiah. And it was clear, like, as the series went along, which is one of the fun things about a playoff series, they just kind of figured out how to send guys to the right spot. But Olenek had to hit the shot. And if you're, if any Celtic fan knows, you know, two out of three times, he's missing those wide open and you go crazy. But last night was the night when they were going in. And you could feel it. And uh, I said to my dad, it was 76-76. 14 minutes left. You had the ball. And I said to my dad, 76-76, 14 minutes left. Here we go. And the Celts just went on a run. And one of the reasons they went on a run, I was thinking about you. I was trying not to feel bad for you. I wanted my team to beat you. But Scott Brooks just, just murdered the game. He left Wall and Beal out there for, the, I think, the entire second half. And and you could see Wall and Beal really getting tired, and Beal especially was exhausted. So make a chance, but Wall just went off the deep end. Were you going nuts when you were watching that? Um, I was going nuts with a different uh, aspect of of the Brooks rotation. 
Um, but I just wanted to do a quick follow-up. So um, by, by design, and you just mentioned that the Celtics, you know, as a Celtics fan, Olenek with those open shots is something that two out of three times you're, you're anxious about. You know, I don't think it was a bad design for the Wizards to um, a, a play I, Isaiah that way and to force uh, somebody like Olenek to beat them. I think that was a pretty sound game plan, and I don't think the Wizards ought to have any regrets about that scheme. Olenek beat well, them. So but here's the thing, though. It was, it was a bad game plan once it stopped working. And that's the thing. They just stuck with it, and Olenek got red hot. And at, that, at some point, you just have to kind of audible on the fly, right? Well, and, that, the, and that was what I thought the mistake was. Because Isaiah was getting worn out on the other end because he, he was guarding Beal for a lot of the game. He got killed. Started Porter a couple times, got killed. They put him on Wall, and the game was in John Wall's hands for Washington. He had Isaiah that's, Thomas guarding him basically for the last 15 minutes of the game. He couldn't do anything. Well, that's the point. The response for the Wizards wasn't a further defensive adjustment. It was to beat the Celtics on the offensive end. And Wall, they, the, the Celtics, uh, you know, sagely observed that Wall, um, you know, as a jump shooter, probably wasn't going to beat them. So they gave him all the room in the world. And Wall did get progressively tired um, over the course of the second half. And the, they, the Wizards did not run any pick and roll at all with him and Gortat. It would have the effect yeah. of, of giving Wall the ability to get to the rim and force the refs to try and, you know, um, change his his particular contribution to the game. So, and I don't think that was necessarily a bad a bad mistake either because, you know, it was right for a little while there to put the, the ball in Beal's hands and, and try and ride Beal. And they got all the way to, they were four points down with six minutes left um, yeah. by way of that strategy. And you just needed something from Wall in that last six minutes to, you know, um, hang right in there and, and, and turn it into a single possession game at the end of the game, and Wall just didn't have it. He didn't have the legs for it, and they didn't run any pick and roll, and he didn't go to the rim, and, and that was it. That was the difference. I mean, they just couldn't crack. Uh, they didn't, didn't get any closer than the four points. I thought watching him in person, he's, he's going so balls to the wall that he just doesn't pace himself, and you know, I think in game two, he got super tired, and it really hurt them. And in this game, he just ran out of gas. And that's something, you know, he's got to figure out. Yeah, you've been watching him forever. He's one of those guys that um, initially when he came into the league was just either one of two gears at all times, either in fifth gear or first gear. Now, then he added kind of a third gear this year. But he, he's got to figure out how to pace himself for these playoff games because you know, Game 7, it's so intense. Like, the crowd was unbelievable. It really was, you know, it, it, a good playoff crowd can swing a game if the teams are relatively even. I felt like yesterday the, the crowd kind of swung the game, and there's so much energy in the building that it wears down the players as the game went along. And that's why it was egregious that Brooks didn't take those guys out. Because you got to play, you got to manage a Game 7 differently. Game 7 is different energy exertion. It, it's more grueling. It's like a football game. Uh, it's longer. It's more intense. And to ask those guys to play the whole half, I, I just thought it was crazy. He played 44 minutes last night. Those last two games, he was 17 for 48. You know, and then he was uh, 8 for 25. I mean, he, he were, you, were you happy with the series he had other than the three-point shot? Oh, I was I was very happy with the series he had. Okay. They, they they wouldn't have been anywhere. They were in in game seven, you know, four points down with six minutes left against the number one seed in the East. Yeah, I was pretty happy with his series. He had a, a, a you know a historical series in terms of the combination of points and assists. Nobody's done the the double digit assists and the number of points that he scored in you know thirty years or something. I didn't have any problem at all with Walls. The Celtics defended him. Well, they defended him properly in the same way that the Wizards defended Isaiah well and defended him properly, and the game had to had, had to go to second tier players. My 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 big complaint with um, you asked about you know the the Brooks rotation and did Brooks play Wall and Beal too long? What we're really talking about is a you know an organizational problem, an institutional problem. The Wizards began the season with nine new players and a brand new coach. And, 
you know, in a series where you just observe the teams were so evenly matched. Sean Grandy sent out a great tweet yesterday afternoon that showed all these stats about how evenly matched. They shot the same percentage from the field. They had the same number of turnovers. I mean, there were a bunch of, of stats that demonstrated just how even and equal these two teams were. Yesterday, the combination of home court advantage plus the effect of home court on the Celtics bench in particular and there's this sort of institutional stability, this organizational stability that the Celtics enjoy over the Wizards in terms of guys that they draft and that, they, that, that Stevens kind of, kind of grooms and that they play a certain way. They all have a slight irrational confidence at home. It doesn't translate onto the road. But anyone, it's why I said at the very beginning of this, Olin was just Celtics bench player number four. It could have been Crowder, who I know is a starter, but it could have been Rozier. It could have been uh, Smart. It could have been any of those guys. And Smart did make, you know, a couple humongous plays last night. But that's, that's, that's cultural. That's organizational. That's institutional. And the Wizards, I said this last time we talked, they're more talented. They have the better players. They had the best player on the floor um, for most of those games, but they didn't have any bench whatsoever. Every, time, every plus minus that you look at that reflects what happened when the bench, anybody from the bench came on the floor – it was grotesque. Last night, the bench was outscored 48-5, to five, and all five of those points was Bogdanovich in the first half. And Bogdanovich can't I'm gonna hurt anybody. Feeling. I'm going to hurt your feeling. Go ahead. Not only did I not think John Wall was the best player on the floor, I, I really thought he hurt you in the series. I, I just felt like I always wanted him to shoot. When he took the game winner in game six, I wanted him to take it. I thought it was a terrible shot. The 28-footer with five seconds left in the shot clock from a guy who was like eight for 25. I mean, if you look at his last five games, he was 39 for 109. That's, he was a 35% shooter for five straight games. It's too many shots. shots. It's too many shots is the point. That doesn't yeah. hurt my feelings. I mean, this is the, this was the, the horse that we rode in on. I didn't want, I didn't want Bradley Beal to shoot. And I gotta be honest. I thought Porter could have been involved more. I, I we couldn't stop him. Well, they don't run Whoever, any plays for him, which is what, what makes him so valuable. Anytime Isaiah was on him, Porter could get a layup on him. Um, and when Wall had Isaiah on him in the fourth quarter, which was basically like the Celtics reached a point in that second half where it was unclear if they could continue playing Thomas because he just couldn't guard Beal. And Beal was in the zone. Beal, Beal by the way, I was thinking about it first quarter he, he had deer in the headlights and and we were watching going wow moment's a little too big for Bradley and then he made a shot and he just kind of locked in and you know I think if if leaving that series as a Wizards fan I think that's Bill he, I mean you had doubts about whether Bill could come through on the road like that right we at the very very beginning of uh this series we observed that you know the best chance for the Wizards was going to have was going to be a game from Beal where he scored, we said something crazy, like 45 points. But last night was that game. I mean, yeah. the Wizards got the very best game out of Beal. They got a great contribution from Porter. Keith was, was, a, was a net positive, uh, was, you know, was, he was, was pretty effective. Good. Yeah, he was pretty good. You know, that, he, the he was hit, with his um, role. The Subs said something smart. Stevens was unbelievable at the series. He kept doing these little tiny things, but they kept trying to have Horford guard Marquise. And Marquise couldn't do anything against Horford. It didn't always happen, but it was something they hadn't really shown that much. And, you know, they just kept throwing different guys at Marquise and hoping he was going to try to post up. Because when he posted up, it really, you know, it was it was a possession that Bradley Beal wasn't shooting. But I, uh, I was so impressed by Beal because he was exhausted. He was you exhausted. Could see it. Like, yeah. I mean, he was like, they were a little, like, anytime the play stopped, his hands was on his knees. He was starting to move slow. So was Wall. I don't understand why Brooks, a couple things. You know, we, we've seen great coaches in Game 7, especially like Carlisle is always really good at this, the guys who can kind of buy time in certain pockets of the game for their players. You know, it's like two minutes left in the third quarter. You call timeout. You come out of it. You call a second timeout a minute later. You're basically buying your guys like eight minutes so they're not actually missing a lot of game time. He wasn't doing any of that, obviously. I I really think that to 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 think you can win a game seven on the road playing your backcourt the entire second half is a suicide mission. I don't understand where Ubre was, unless he just thought Ubre was just so 
mentally out of it that he was like a danger to the team, you know. Uh, so that's the big I, curiosity, right? This is the thing with Brooks, the, you know, brand new team for him. You don't know who he trusts in big moments. And I think last night he made the wrong call in a couple of different ways in not showing trust. So Brandon Jennings is the answer to giving Wall some time. And Ubre right. should have been the guy that um, gave Beal some time. And he just didn't um, trust. It, it's apparent. He didn't trust either Jennings or uh, Ubre enough to put them out there and let them just well, get you know what was happening by with, that time. With Jennings, with Jennings they, when he would come in, the Stevens would immediately put Isaiah in. Because it, it was all of a sudden now you you can hide Isaiah and Jennings on one end, and then on the other end they couldn't you know they can't put Jennings on anyone. But it's tough. It's really tough to play young guys in big playoff road games. Like if you look at you know what happened with the Celtics, their young guys didn't show up for any of the road games. Jalen Brown was MIA, you know. But put young guys at home. And that Stevens was smart. He did that. In all four home games, he gave Jalen a lot of run. I thought Jalen was uh, – I thought he made a real difference yesterday. I don't know what his plus minus was, but I guarantee it was good. Like, he he, uh, he used his athleticism. His D was good. He played with real energy. He played with purpose. He was actually moving, you know, when people were shooting. And um, I thought him – Marcus was a stinker in the first half, and then the second half was – you know, that was one of the all-time Marcus games. But this is the He's, thing. This is the difference between our two teams. It's the slightest of differences. Yeah. But those role players at home, because of what I'm calling this organizational stability, this you know, this, yeah. this this grooming that Stevens, you know, puts these guys through, what Brooks did yesterday, I don't think it's really fair to criticize him necessarily. He put in guys who've played in the NBA before. So he had a lineup yes, last yesterday – that really, to me, last night um, set the course for when the Celtics really started running downhill, which was Jan yeah. Mahinmi, Jason Smith, yeah. and Boyan Bogdanovich all played together. Mm. I, I, have, I have no idea how many minutes they played together this season. I'd be shocked if it was more than 25 minutes that the three of them have been on the floor at the same time this season. But all that Scotty did was default to guys that, he's know, that he knows that have, have played in NBA games. I I'm glad he didn't have Brandon Jennings out there. Oh, he, you know, Jennings might have been out there as well. But that was really the, the lineup that had the Celtics running downhill. And that's not Scotty Brooks' fault in this sense. I can't who believe can he put on Scottie the floor? Like who, who should be out there playing? Jason Smith was a minus 13 in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I watched it. I know. The, the, the Celtics went on a 13 3 run. In about 35 seconds with that lineup on the floor. Let's take a quick break to talk about credit-wise from Capital One. You know what? Numbers are great. WIP, WAR, PR, but on their own, they don't tell the whole story. And guess what? Credit isn't any different. With credit, it's all about how well you perform against the factors that go into a credit score. Let's break it down. How good are you at paying your bills on time? How much credit do you have spread across different accounts? How long have those accounts been open? All of these factors impact your credit health, and since there's no one single score that lenders use, knowing these factors are key, just like on the field. There's a lot more to your credit than just knowing your score. CreditWise lets you track the factors that make up your credit health using information from your TransUnion credit report. The app can help you spot errors or identify theft and lays out information you need to understand your behaviors and how they impact your credit health. Plus, you can check it anytime without negatively impacting your credit. And the best part, it's 100% free for everybody. Whether you're a Capital One customer or not, step up your game. Download CreditWise today. So did you think you were going to win? There was a point in that third quarter when Isaiah wasn't going. At halftime, we went. I saw the J-Bug at halftime. I was like, it's like you nervous? I'm like, Isaiah's not playing well. We're not making threes. The Celtics usually don't win when those two things are happening at the same time. But then the game flipped. What? What? Why do you think it flipped? Because Olenek had 14 in the fourth, but he didn't flip the game when it started to flip. It felt like Marcus Smart and Jalen Brown, and then a couple Isaiah threes were what flipped it. What did you think happened? The reserves came in. The Wizards put out that lineup. Scott, Scotty Brooks had to rest some starters, and he bought time, and, and the, the Celtics immediately ripped off. They went 18-3 to 3 
from three minutes and 30 seconds left in the third quarter through, you know, the, the first couple minutes yeah. of the fourth quarter, an 18-3 to three run. That was the ball game. The Wizards were up six. They were up 70-64. to 64. The Celts, ex, you know, kind of expectedly battled back, um, got to 76-76. You mentioned that point in the game. You said 14 minutes left, 76-76. I actually thought the Wiz had a good chance at winning because I thought that Wall had, a, um, you know, a superstar performance uh, saved up for the fourth quarter. It, 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 the, the run that the Celtics went on proved insurmountable, um, even with the, the, the battle back. I mean, the Wiz battled all the way back to, to got it to a four-point game with six and a half minutes left. But it took too much out of him, and Wall did not have anything left. It, it, it became apparent. He kept taking those jumpers, and they kept hitting the front of the rim, and that was it. John Wall, you know, if you're going to be one of the one of the great porn stars, I need you to perform a couple times a day on the shoot. <laughs> Can't just come in and be in one shoot and be like, I'm done, I'm winded. I, I, I need you to go to multiple locations. I, he, he's thing. been John to multiple Wall, locations. No, this is John, the John Wall's Wall, Wall, one and done No, yeah, no. This is the hard that, thing that, about this Wizards that. team. He and he and Beal both were superhuman. They were on all locations with 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 all actresses all season long. It required a superhuman <laughs> effort for them to get the forty nine win. Yeah. Well, I still think there's a slight power struggle with those two guys. And and I'm not I'm not saying it. I don't know what what their relationship like is like off the court, but I think at some point that Wizards have to decide whose team that is. And whether it it makes sense in any situation for John Wall to take 109 shots in the last five playoff games in the series, I would say no. I would say just as somebody who rooted against him for seven games, he's a fantastic, devastating transition guy. That anytime the Celtics, all they did those last few games was just try to stay in his way when he's in transition. He's he's an okay three point shooter if he's wide open. And he's good coming off the pick and rolls, neither dishing or driving. But his offensive game, for for how many years he's been in the league, it's just not that sophisticated. And whereas Beal is just like, I mean, Beal is Ray Allen. That, I think I think that's the kind of career he's going to have. That's like, Beal is a guy who's going to score 27, 28 a game. In well, the you next have to remember, years. though, Beal, you observed the deer in the headlights look in the first quarter for Beal. And the concern was that that, you you watched the first three games in Boston. Beal didn't really show up. He was kind of there right. for 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 you know a portion of game two, but he had a terrible shooting night, except for eight points in the fourth quarter. That did you know right. help close the, young, the, the gap a Isn't little. Isn't he like twenty three? He's twenty three. This is the thing. Wall is twenty six. Yeah. Beal is twenty three. Porter is right in there as well. I mean, it's a nice young nucleus. The problem with my my guys. We have $30 million committed to guys that, are, that really shouldn't play in the league anymore. I mean, Gortat and Mahinmi don't really have a role in the NBA. Mahinmi's a perfectly fine backup center who should make $4.5 million a year. Unfortunately, we're paying him 16 That was horrible. And especially, you know, so many teams overpaid centers last year, and the market cratered right after it happened, and you can get those guys for free now. You know? And that Gortat, I'm a little higher on than you because I've never seen – anyone set more moving picks that weren't called in my life. Like, obviously, he's, I don't know whether the refs feel bad for him or what's going on, but I actually thought his moving picks were uh, were really helping Beal get open. It was phenomenal to watch in person. He's using his hands. He's shoving guys. He does. He didn't was, have a couple shoves. It was, uh, it, was, it was really impressive. So, a couple things from behind the scenes last night. The Buck, the J-Buck, you're... One of my favorite, uh, one I'm of your laughing favorite already. friends. He was sitting literally behind the Wizards bench for Game Five and Game Seven, uh, close enough to repeatedly yell at them for most of Game Five to the point that Scott Brooks alerted security and was upset because the guy was interrupting him during the timeout. That was the J book. So that was happening. <laughs> then, game, then uh, game seven, um, they were so concerned about the bug that they were pointing the security before the game, trying to get him to, you know, trying to get him basically to, to watch him. So the bug had to be on his best behavior. But 
the bug the bug wanted me to tell you that any any high level NBA coach who's that concerned about the bug during a must win playoff game probably has some flaws. That was the bug's takeaway. I mean, there was a lot of observation in the Twitter sphere about you know r- r- reminding everybody of Scotty Scotty Brooks' playoff limitations, especially rotation. I got a lot of Kendrick Perkins tweets last night. Yeah, he's 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 pretty inflexible. You know, I, I definitely think Steven Steven's definitely if you flip the coaches, like probably win the series. Can we agree on that? I, I, it's it's tough to say. I mean, the home court thing was a big deal. And again, I, I go back to this institutional stability thing. Um, just the fact that even even Jalen, right? He Jalen Brown's already bought into that Celtics way in terms of hard nosed defender. Right. You have a bunch of of guys that 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 are all kind of hard nosed defender, shoot three kind of guys. Um, and that's obviously by design. So I it, I don't know if you if you flip the coaches if that's the it, it definitely was the case that Stevens had something for everything that Scotty put put out there, you know, uh, yeah. and, and immediately took advantage any time that the bench came out in any kind of force for Washington. Stevens immediately took advantage of it. I mean, you know, we knew this from the going in, though. The Wizards began the season with a historically bad bench, and at the end of the season, it was that bad bench that cost them the, 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 the seven-game series. I was scared of Bogdanovich. And and I know that I know that the lineups, you know, they had trouble hiding him on defense, all that stuff. But I didn't feel like he was scared. He made that one shot over Rozier, uh, that was just like a, you know, one of those shots that you make when you played in like a thousand big playoff games in weird foreign countries that you're just not scared. Yep. And uh, I thought that was the one guy he could have played more. I would have figured out how to stagger him. I, I would have tried. I also think they could have gone small because it's not like we rebound anyway. I wouldn't have played well, Mahinmi at all. I Oubre, just played... I, that's it. Mahinmi shouldn't have played one single minute. He was an play... absolute disaster every he second he was on the floor. He took something off the table every second he was on the floor. The if Ubre and, and Bogdanovich had gotten those those Mahinmi minutes, I would I would just would have been interested in seeing it. I mean, the length of Ubre and his ability to to scoot around. Screens. Yeah. I mean, that was part of the thing that Olenek got so much space because Gortat kept going underneath the screen. I'm not killing Gortat. Um, it was by design to give Kelly those open shots. But, uh, you know, I just would have been interest, see, interested in seeing if Ubre could have got up um, quicker to him. It gave him a little bit more to think about. The Bugs' other takeaway from being behind the bench was that he thinks the Wizards and Celtics are going to have a nice little rivalry the next year. Excuse he was like, we're going to be seeing those guys every year. I hope you get right. that going for your house. You just I need to figure right. out. Is there a way to figure out Jan Mahindy to leave for Europe? Can you convince like a European team to <laughs> buy his contract? Well, I mean, there's got to be a trade out there. Don't, don't the Kings need a center? Can't we trade with the Kings? I would trade him immediately. For Jan is, 16 million for Jan is pretty rough. Why did God. they do that? It was weird when it happened. Why did they do that? When it happened, you were horrified. I mean, the idea was like, we're going to have a shop blocker. We're going to have a rim protector, I guess. That okay. was the idea. Is there is there a bigger drop-off in the history of basketball than, than that was Kevin Durant's money and it went to Jan Mahindy? <laughs> that was not Kevin Durant's money. It's not fair to call it that. Well, I mean, hypothetically. Quick break to talk about massages. Everyone loves massages, but it's always hard to book one. Well, what if you could book a five-star top quality massage at a time that works for you in the most convenient place of all, your home? Check out zeal.com. Same day in-home massages with the best licensed and vetted massage therapist on demand at home. Z-E-E-L.com. Download the iPhone or Android app. Select a massage therapist. Choose your favorite technique, gender preference, time and location for your massage 365 days a year. They can be there in less than an hour. The massage table, music, everything you need to turn your living room into a spa. Scheduling, booking, payment, fast and easy. Even the tip is included. No money changing hands. Deal costs an, on average 20 to 50% less than going to a local spa or hotel. Find out for yourself. Why Zeal has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Vogue, and Good Morning America. Guess what? Our listeners can get $25 off their first massage. 
by using the promo code BS at checkout. And if you sign up for Zeal's massage membership, you get 20% off all your massages plus a free massage table and sheet set. That's a $380 value, yours free. No initiation fee to join the membership. Just go to Zeal, Z E E L dot com or use Zeal's iPhone or Android app. Make sure you click add promo code at checkout. Use my code BS to get $25 off your first in home on demand massage. Speaking of massages, the Cavs are minus 700 against the Celtics in the conference finals. Is that line too high or too low? Sounds about right to me. That's too advanced. That's the line to advance. I can't remember a team that didn't have home court advantage being a bigger favorite than that. That has to that's, be a record. That's They're a great seven point. seven-one favorites that don't even have home court. That's a great point. I'm trying to think about it. Did, did the Spurs? No. Nope. I can't, I'm proud of that. I've never heard it's of it. It's going to be a hard thing. one. Maybe the Lakers? There's no, there's no 2001 Patriots potential with this, right? Is this like no. the all-time nobody believes in us scenario? No. No? Not really? Not happening? I don't think so. Your, Your team best probably bet is winning one game. Chance. Your team would have probably had a better chance. I agree I'm not with counting that. out my team, but, uh, you know. It's a bad matchup. Here's the, here's the thing. Yeah, it's a terrible matchup. But the Celtics are good at home. And they have four of the seven games that are at home. So, I don't know. I, I'd be super disappointed if they go six or seven. Maybe I think the you're going to be super disappointed maybe. then. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the best you yeah. can hope for is winning one game, one of these home games. Try to answer this question without going to be fired. How is LeBron getting better? I just don't understand it. I know the rules have moved his way. I wrote about it on Friday. I wrote a column about it and LeBron. The, the, the spacing, the science, the geometry of it, it's all moved in his favor. It's great. I don't understand how he's getting stronger, faster, and better. I just don't. It's year 14. There should be signs of attrition at this point. Now he's got nine days rest. And he's going to waltz into Boston. And, yeah, you're right. Why should I be optimistic? The guy's playing as bad as well as he's ever played. One of the he he rope-a-doped us this season. He, he, he did. He, he and Ty Lue both, they rope-a-doped us. He, for whatever reason, and I still don't understand it, he led the league in minutes through, like, the first, you know, 35 or 40 games. And then he basically put it on cruise control for 46 games. For the, for, you yeah. know, they were 23 and 23 over the last 46. And that was the right move. It was absolutely the, the, the correct uh, approach for, for, for Cleveland. And, you know, they, they pick up another couple spare parts along the way. Darren Williams can play all of a sudden again. And, I, you know, he's now had this playoff um, run. In addition to the nine days, you know, that he just got, didn't he get some incredible amount of rest? Um, after the first series as well? I mean, before yeah, the first he's series? he's got a ton of rest. It's, yeah. It's terrible. It, it really makes me unhappy. He's so rested. The, uh, yeah, we have to quickly talk about a couple of things here. One is, both of us wanted to vote for, we, we both wanted, even though I know you had a little money on Harden. Well, I had money on wanted, Kawhi also. I had money on everybody. You squared around. I did. As, as just NBA fans, we wanted, LeBron to lay this back down for another MVP season, just for history's sake. Well, because and it was going to validate the the finals performance from the previous season. That was the main reason to me. Yeah, and and also like you know he's he's the best player in the league and the guy that we pick when the aliens land and all that stuff. So he'd be the first call. And it's in this year where it was like Westbrook's MVP candidacy was so hard to talk ourselves into. Harden was. You know, the wins was the biggest factor for him, but they they barely got to the mid fifties. Kawhi just was an advanced metrics argument. It was hard to talk. I wanted LeBron to be the pick, and then the team went in the tank, and he kind of left an MVP on the table. But now it's not going to matter because he's going to go into the finals, running on all cylinders. The Harden thing, though. Oh man, I. Now I actually, feel terrible about that vote. I feel awful about it. And let's well, get a concussion. I disagree with with feeling bad about that vote. I the the people that should feel bad are all the hoops perverts 
that voted for Westbrook, who managed to lead his team to a single playoff game victory. And I, I, I defy anybody. Go into the history, the annals of the NBA history books, and find me a league MVP who led his team to a single playoff victory, you perverts. That's the guy that, that I think you, you know, folks properly um, should feel bad about. Well, well Moses, Harden, didn't, Moses didn't make the playoffs one year, so he's, he's the standard. What year was that? It was like 80 81? They don't, 81, 82. Nobody knew. People barely. We, we, people, it was like the third year after the, after the, uh, the media started voting for the MVP. Okay, well, that's, and basketball that's, wasn't on t- basketball That's wasn't 35 on years ago. Yeah. Well, and it went, basketball wasn't on television. People were just looking at box cards, voting for the MVP. It was insane. And they, they went 40 and 42, and he won. He did have like a 31 and 15, just for, just for the record. It wasn't like it was, you team, know. But. What the 35 yeah. years ago stuff doesn't really um, carry much water for me. But in any yeah. event, um, the Harden thing was is most curious. I actually read some Houston newspapers. I listened to Chris Vernon's podcast with um, the gentleman from uh, the sports radio in Houston whose name, Sean. Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember your last name, Sean. But it was a very good podcast. And what was super revealing to me was that the people of Houston, the player that they like the best on that Houston team, is not James Harden, it's Patrick Beverly. Mm. Because they, they feel like Beverly is, is you know, he, he better fits that Houston uh, e- ethos is what I'll say. Like, you know, you have J.J. Watt there with the football team. You have Altuve, the um, Astros baseball right. dude. And and Harden doesn't Brady. fit the profile of those guys exactly, and so Beverly well, is, is, is this, the guy. And I, I'm mad I didn't think of this before the playoffs, but so be it. You live and you learn. I think the Rockets were like those football teams that we watch in the NFL that have some sort of offensive gimmick that works really well in the regular season, and everybody puts up huge stats, and it's really fun to watch. But you don't really take them seriously in January. Cold, cold weather, you know, kind of come down to the basics. At that point, these weird, you know, like the run and shoot, it's not working. Or like the Buffalo Bills offense, not working in January and February. And I wonder if the Rockets were like that because they're so, so conditioned, just freeze and free throws. And that's their whole game plan. You so know, and that's it. But that's I don't, all they want. We, what? We, we, Hamled on it, <laughs> and we observed before the series started that they had a great chance to beat the Spurs, and we weren't wrong. They had a great chance to beat the Spurs. They but here, have here's, why, here's why we were wrong. Because as the series went along, the Spurs just said, we're going to give you long twos. Here you go. We're, play, we're playing everyone on the line. We're not letting anyone drive, and you can have all the foul line jumpers you want. And the Rockets could not audible. They they didn't have they didn't have like a like a second way to be like, oh, you're gonna give us this, let's just take this. Like you get to the playoffs, you gotta take what what's there. You can't just be like, We're playing our system. This is what we are. Well, you know, I can't believe I'm gonna say game. this. What it, it changed when Nene got hurt. The series yeah, changed when Nene got I mean, hurt. That, that's the thing. That you're right, because playing Ryan Anderson at center, but the thing is they had Harold. Carroll had good minutes for them in the regular season. That's what I didn't get. But um, I just thought they were too predictable at the end of the game. You know, they, everyone's just standing around, hard and dribbling. We went crazy watching it, you know. It was and, brutally, brutally bad watching that game five, the end of the game. It hurt my eyes. And the other thing is to rely on somebody the way they relied on him and, to re- and for OKC to rely on Westbrook the way they relied on him. At some point, it's it's almost too big of a burden. The way these well, playoff games go, like I thought, Harden was either he was concussed or he was just dead by Game Six. But he was so bad in Game Six, I mean, that was like that's going to go down in the pantheon. Do we that's, think that's that going to be one of the worst playoff games? It's on the short list. It's with like Rick Barry in 1976, Scottie Pippen's my great game, and LeBron in 2011. Like it's on the fucking short list. I I wondered if he quit on D'Antoni. I wondered if nah. something. I. I but what's the explanation? He, 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 maybe the injury. Maybe something will come out in six weeks about I think him. He got hit. 
No, they'll never okay. admit it. I, I swear, I think I never said when it happened. I was because he's had a concussion before. That's the red flag for me. Because you know, I got knocked out when I was sixteen, and um, anytime I get a hit in the head, I'm not the same. It takes me like two days to recover, and, and it's just like once you've had one, you, your brain when you get hit in the head, it's just not the same. And I wonder if he got his egg scrambled a little bit because watching him pass up wide open shots and all the shit he did. But anyway, like I was thinking, it, it's just so hard to win when you're asking one guy to do everything. And really only two guys have ever done it, LeBron and and and, uh, and MJ. Have yeah. ever won a title doing that. You know, even like Kobe. People point to Kobe in 09 and 2010. It's like, those teams are really good. He had Pau Gasol and Andrew, Andrew Bynum on his team and a bunch of great shooters. And he didn't have to do everything. And his stats in the 09 finals and the 2010 finals were not that great. Pat you know, Powell was the got, difference maker there. I thought Powell should have won the 2010 finals MVP. I, he was he was the, the most reliable guy they had in it. But well, um, what I can't wait to see is the backlash ne- next year's MVP race and the vote is going to be incredible because there's going to be a real backlash against this this thing that you're talking about right now, which is individual players just, you know, leading the team and, and how that, that doesn't translate into any kind of postseason success. It's really hard to win when you just have the one guy. And, you know, LeBron found that out the last two years in Cleveland. Uh, Harden found that out. Westbrook's going to keep finding that out. And it's probably, you know, the biggest reason Durant went to Golden State because I think he's a really smart basketball mind who saw it the right way. And you saw it Durant. Like, Sunday's game, it's a bummer that Kawhi and, Kawhi and Zaza turned into the story from that game because, you know, for me the story was they're down 23. And I know Kawhi got hurt. I know it's won the momentum. But but I was sitting there watching it, waiting for them to come back, regardless of what happened to Kawhi, because they have Kevin Durant and Steph Curry in their team. And you just figured one of them was going to get hot. Curry was amazing in that third quarter, you know. And then Durant took over the fourth quarter. And that's like – that's why they're one of the great teams of all time. There's the, there's three teams in the history of the NBA that have had two guys that could alternate quarters like that who are at the very, 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 very top of their game, you know? It's completely effed up that Kawhi got hurt and they went on that run. I, I can't get past yeah. it. I mean, I, I'm not giving yeah. the Warriors super-duper credit. They had the, the, the Spurs had their number. If Kawhi played that whole game, the Spurs win. And I'll, I'll go to my grave believing that. Really? They were beating I, I, I their ass. The they were beating were the their ass. Hmm. I, th- I think the Warriors, it's just too hard to beat them when those two guys play well. They weren't playing that well. Kawhi had, had you know, uh, he, was, he, was a, wrote, he was playing free safety on the perimeter. It was incredible. Yeah, it's too bad. Did you think... I, I, I'm sti- I, I was 60-40 when it happened, and now I'm like 75-25 after I saw some of Zaza's history. And also, like, Hench made a good point, my buddy Hench. Like, it, I was thinking back to bas- playing basketball, and people, you know, when we used to play before we became retired old white guys. Um, if somebody shot a jump shot and somebody ran under them so that their feet landed on the defender, it probably would have caused a fight. There would have been a fight. Of course there would have been yeah. a fight. Everybody knows you that that's don't a, do it. You, you just don't, don't do it, it ever. So that, that made me think, because I, I was watching, like, oh, maybe you didn't think when Hedge said that. I was like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you, you don't do that under any circumstance. You just don't. It's why, that, it's yeah. why Al Horford's a cheater. Uh, see, that one, I, I, I don't feel the same way. Uh, that, you, you can feel Al however Horford's you want to feel. Man. Hey, we're going to talk about the ladder really, really quickly. But first, I want to tell you about the blacktux.com. They've made such a great for a wedding or a special event. The easiest it's ever been. With high quality rental suits and tuxedos delivered to your doorstep, the Black Tux giving guys a new way to rent. They offer free home try on. So you can see the fit, feel the quality of your suit months before the event. And the best part, it's completely done online. No trips to the tuck shop required. No creepy tailors breathing all over you. What's worse than creepy tailors? No, nothing. Uh, now, uh, I don't black- want anybody touching my butt. The black com lets you create your look from tons of stylist selected outfits starting at just $95. Modern made from Italian wool. The finest Italian wool. Absolutely the highest quality in the rental market. Any issues in their expert customer care team will, give you, give, will have your back every step of the way. 
after ordering your suit arrives 14 days before your event, that's a full two weeks to try it on. Make sure everything fits or if anything is less than perfect. And if not, Black Duck will send you a free replacement right away after you're done. Drop your rental back in the mail. Shipping free both ways. How easy is that? Get started right now. Visit the com slash BS. That's the Black Tux, T-U-X, dot com slash BS to get $20 off your purchase. Experience a new way to rent tuxedos. Again, that's the Black Tux, dot com slash BS. So we think the Spurs are done. I, I'm a firm believer. If you should have won a game on the road when you don't have home court, don't win it. It becomes almost impossible. I mean, the Wizards found out if Bradley Beal has an alligator arm that's shot in game two, you probably win the series in game six, right? Probably win in game six. You're right. Yeah. yeah real wild card for the, the Spurs, obviously, is Kawhi. Can he come back? It was weird seeing him hurt. It was almost like it reminded me of Terminator 2 when, when uh, Schwarzenegger, the robot, is like, he's lost his legs. He's just kind of crawling. So, you know, it, it, it was like he it was. Seeing Kawhi mortal was kind of shocking. And he almost didn't, he didn't get hurt the way normal people get hurt. Like, he wasn't rolling around the ground. He was just trying to get up. Yep. And his body, his robot body was cooperating. I felt bad for him. Well, I want him to get up. I want him out there, even if it's on one leg. Nobody ever, you know, everyone's blaming Zaza. Nobody mentioned the, uh, the his teammate who tripped him the first time to hurt the leg five minutes before. I thought that was <laughs> Welcome. I love Popovich getting mad at him, but it's great. That was the best. I mean, Pop, nobody does it better. That was for it his was team. Like, He's standing up for his team. It was almost like he, he had written down a monologue and memorized it like Philip Seymour Hoffman and read this 90-second monologue. It was a wonderful um, performance. I actually believe that he did that. It did. It felt very much like a script, and I, you know, yeah. he, it was an excellent performance by him. And but that was for his team, right? That was for his, his guys to believe. Now they now they have nobody believes in us, and we've been done dirty. That's pretty powerful. Yeah. Do you know Jonathan Simmons is a free agent? He's he's a, the the most interesting two guys to me. For the Spurs are Simmons and Deadman. Why can't Deadman get more time? I don't understand why. Why? I mean, that's somebody you guys could have signed him to the Jan Mahindic. I don't want to hear it. You could have signed him for less than sixty million dollars a year. I promise. You. That hurts my feelings. He, he, he could. He could have been like five million dollars a year. God, that extra ten million Damn to give to anybody. Um, Simmons to me, I was down with uh, O'Connor and Jark about this. On Monday, I I have no idea what his free agent value is worth. Like he could, the Spurs have like he might sign with them for two years, eight million dollars, and we wouldn't be surprised. Right? Like, oh, that's nice to catch on Simmons. He could also sign with Brooklyn for like ninety million dollars, and I don't know if I would be surprised by that either. Well, look, I don't know what his free agent feeling is. Would you rather have him or Tyler Johnson? Would you rather have him or Garrett Temple? Would you rather have him or what's that or kid? Alan Crabb. Alan Crabb. What about Alan Crabb? Seventy yeah. million for Alan Crabb. Right. Here's the thing. We have, we've watched Jonathan Simmons play huge in, in big playoff games that were on national TV on both ends. We've watched him guard James Harden. We've watched him create his own shot. We've watched him make three-pointers. I don't understand why... That's somebody that, you know, all these teams with cast players are looking at. Everyone's looking for three and D guys. And this is also somebody who can drive to the rim and play defense at the highest level. I don't know. He's a sleeper. I have a feeling. I think the Spurs would sign and trade right Otto Porter. I think I could get an Otto Porter sign and trade for Jonathan Simmons. Yeah. I don't know. They, they don't have the sign and trade. I would not give up Otto Porter just for the rest. If you were I know. that It's a real conundrum. Somebody's going to offer him twenty million dollars, and I think my my team has to match it. You got to match it. The problem is you know he, I, he he disappears sometimes. I know, but he like game six. I if I if I ran the Wizards, and and maybe that day's coming. Uh, when you and I when you and I are put in charge of the GMs of the Wizards, and I announce something, I would just study Game Seven like it was the Zapruder film and try to figure out who was scared and who wasn't scared and. Whoever I, c- I could come at, I watch that tape and I go, all right, out of order, count on him. Just start from there. You start backwards. Who are, who are my guys on this team that look like they wanted to be in that game? Then you go from there. All right, lottery. I did the lottery wow. karma power ranking. You did. Um, 
it's it's kind of an inexact science because it, I'm not totally sure how to how to determine what the karma gods look for, but I do think it's a combination of did you handle your business the right way? Um, are you in are you in desperate need of a break? Um, does your fan base need this? Would other fan bases secretly kind of be happy for you that you finally had something good happen? But then you also have the organizational malpractice part that should hurt your karma. Like with Sacramento, where they've just been so incompetent for so long, it's like you shouldn't be rewarded for your incompetence. And yet in this column, I gave the Knicks the top spot, even though you could argue that they've had the same organizational incompetence. Now the, the catch is they were a second round playoff team four years ago. So it's not like Sacramento has been in the playoffs for thirteen years. You know. And I, I think the Knicks Minnesota. still have a couple more years of being punished for Phil Jackson's arrogance. I don't think they're quite wow. at the point. They haven't been broken all the way down. Jackson still has a job. He needs to get fired before the karma gods will start to look favorably upon them. Yeah, I should have batted this calm around with you because I feel so, I feel bad for the Knicks fans. I, I do feel like they've hit rock bottom. Sure. And that was driving me for that. But if, I, I'm already having second thoughts because I think Denver has a really good case for being number one, just from handling their business for the most part the right way, making the honest effort to make the playoffs, stuff like that. And then I think I should have ranked Dallas higher. I didn't rank Dallas higher because they've had so much success in the 2000s, and then they won the title in 2011. They spent a lot of money. But, you know, I felt like they made an honest effort to compete this year. And they do everything the right way, and they try to win. They never try to bottom out. They're always trying to seek some sort of advantage. And I think that was the one I underrated. Who did you think I underrated the most? I honestly, this is going to uh, sound bizarre. I, I think Sacramento, <laughs> I, I can't even really say it with a straight face, but I think they deserve a break. They they kind of won that bookie trade. Mm. I, 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 I think in, in, in retrospect, the uh, Pelicans pick is going to translate into something. I'm rooting for something completely irrational and unexpectedly good to happen to Sacramento. And I don't have a, an explanation for it, but I, I, you know, they, they, the parting with Boogie is such a, a, a t- title change in um, their overall fortunes. I'm, I'm hoping that that um, gives them something to, to, you know, build off of. I was thinking about Boogie last night because I still want him in Washington, by the way. Well, I mean, that's the thing. If you let him in that game, you win. It opens up the entire floor. You can go inside, outside with him and Beal. And, you know, you're probably two years away, right? Doesn't he have two years left on his deal? So you gotta, Assuming he stays in New Orleans. In New Orleans. He's not staying there. That's, it. that's not going to work with those two guys. Yeah, I agree. My guess would be that eventually he ends up on your team if I had to, if I had to make a wager. Hmm. That would be my expert opinion. What about the Lakers? Is there any chance they don't get a top three pick? I'm going to say 0% chance. <laughs> I mean, there's going to be, it feels like a hot ping pong ball thing, right? Like one of the ping pong balls has a little more air in it. They, you know, you, the, the technology mm. is such that you can definitely affect, if we can deflate the footballs, you can definitely do something to a ping pong ball to cause, you know, some number of them to, to rise quicker than others. And if that, if there's any, you know, the ideal gas law or whatever you want to say, if you, you know, you could, I would fill up a couple of those balls with farts and that's the, one of those fart balls would be the one that the Lakers could have popped <laughs> to the top. That'd be fair. That would be a massive uh, fraud. Oh, okay. I think it's actually illegal for the NBA to do that. To <laughs> if you say so. Yeah. Um, and plus, after they fixed the 1985 ladder, I mean, can you really go back to the well? Oh no, you definitely can. <laughs> I, uh, I theorized in in the piece that you know if they ended up with Lonzo, maybe that's not a great thing for them. Now you're dealing with his dad. His dad's running the show. His dad's be you know you're kind of letting the Lavar Ball uh, tumor kind of grow from within. I, I disagree with that. Okay. Yeah, the most important thing for Ball is to play well, and his dad's not going to do anything to alter, you know, all of this grandstanding right now is, is perfectly timed and perfectly placed. 
And it's exactly what he should be doing in this crazy age of brand building and all the other nonsense. It's the, it's the illogical conclusion to an irrational moment in terms of, you know, athletes and, and the media. But when, they, when, he, when he straps them on, the kid's got to go play because all this stuff is, doesn't mean a lick if the kid can't play. So I think the dad, I think it's, it's a fair gamble, and especially in L.A., because, you know, the, the L.A. will only indulge it for, for half a minute before, um, you know, the, the, the whole uh, city comes down on the dad if he has any kind of negative impact at all on the kid's development. So I think L.A. is the best place for him. It is an unbelievable combo with not just they would lose the pick, but that but then to, to add a kicker of losing the 2019 pick to Orlando, it, it's the most fascinating lottery moment we've had since LeBron in 2003, where Memphis either won the first pick and kept them or they lost the pick. This is even better because, you know, this draft is, is really deep at the top. I, I think this has a chance to be one of the, uh, one of the all-timers of the century. And to, to just sit that out, to not get a guy, not to get anyone, but then also to not have a pick two years from now, it just completely changes the course of the franchise. So I would say they are the number one topic of interest tonight. And then number two is Philly, which, you know, they did everything correctly. And they have it. They, they basically are, are locked into two top seven picks, assuming it fall, everything falls their way. But also because they have Sacramento. Pick swap, they have like almost a 15% chance of getting the top pick. And, you know, they might have a powerhouse in eight hours, particularly for this more East Coast time. But eight and a half hours from now, they might, Philly might be the powerhouse. They might have like the first and fourth pick of this draft. Who knows? I'm rooting for it. I'm fine with that. I don't have any problem with that. They can, they, they should get one of those fart balls. I like, you know, we need Joel Embiid to play. We, we need to see him. The 30 games was so tantalizing. We need we need to see Saric. We need to see Simmons. We need to see whoever they they acquire here. It's important for the uh, the East to have another up and coming team. We really have a, a great um, opportunity with Milwaukee and the Greek Freak and and you know the little nucleus that they've put together there. But let's have another great young team here in the East to make the East you know exciting again. Yeah, the East is really in trouble because it looks like Toronto has now become. It was first the Pacers kind of plateaued too low, and now it's the that's the Raptors, which is kind of what do you do? You're not anywhere close to LeBron, and kind of had your window. And now you're gonna pick out Lowry. So you're right, Milwaukee is the next one, but Milwaukee's got to be able to sign because they're we, not gonna be you have lottery. Milwaukee and Miami on the come up. Miami had my. Miami is the always star course for free agents. The thing is, is Miami really on the come up though? They don't have like the the franchise creator guy. You know, they they played well. They have a very good organization, but they still need like the guy. Got to be somebody. True. That's true. So Miami would be if Miami won the lottery, which they won't because they have the lowest percentages. But that that would be the biggest, you know, game changer. I think. Other than the, the thing top. to keep an eye out for them is if they crack the top 10, because it feels like there's 10 guys that could, could be game changers. If one of those Kentucky kids falls down into like the 7, 8, falls 9, down 10, past 10. People are going to talk themselves out of a couple of these guys. I think Malik Monk is somebody that could drop further than he should. Um, but one of the point guards will drop just because everybody doesn't need a point guard. You know, you got six top 10 point guards in this draft. It's on yeah. the top 11 point guards, and it's like not everybody's going to want a point guard. People are going to want, you know, all types of positions. So um, there's also, nobody's really talked about this, but there's some serious trade up potential too. Oh. You know, like, like if, let's say Philly has kids five and seven, and the Celtics got one. Belichick can flip one for five and seven. I think Ainge would too. I think Ainge would too. I think it's in play, especially mm. if you feel like, you know, you really like the team you have and you're just trying to add assets. I'd rather have two cracks at the top seven because as we learn every year, the best guy in the draft isn't necessarily the guy who was drafted with the first pick. It could be well, your team at the, at the end of, of this uh, Cleveland series, 
the exit interview for your team. It's a really weird juncture. You'll know what pick or picks you have, and you'll know you'll have a general sense of who you're going to acquire, and you know that you're going to pay IT, the little guy, a max. Where, where yeah. does your team go? Like, what is the, you know, it, it, the, the series with Washington uh, demonstrated how role player reliant they are. Um, yeah. And, and IT, you know, it's a vulnerability to have him as the, the sole option. Horford was a nice complimentary piece, but like, you need another dog. You need well, another dog in Boston. It's the Jay Crowder spot. Nice guy, agree. good teammate. My dad's least favorite Celtic this season. Yeah, was he six eight on he was six eight on one guy in the Celts, one guy in the it's like a it's like a dad thing to do. You six eight on the one guy. But you know, there's a chance they're gonna get Gordon Hayward. And what, and that's another thing, like with this week that the Celtics are having on Thursday the all NBA teams come out. And if Gordon Hayward doesn't get thirteen mile NBA, it becomes a lot more reasonable for him to Utah because he wouldn't be leaving nearly as much money on the table by not staying there. And, you know, if you just flip Jay Crowder for Gordon Hayward, that's, that's kind of a dramatic difference. It's pretty good. It's, a, it's an improvement. It's I think it's and, an then improvement. If you, and then if you pick, let's say, Fault or let's say, I don't know, um, Darren Fox, Darren Fox or, uh, Dennis, whoever, you just put them in the Rogier spot. And you're getting, next year, you're getting 15, 16 minutes a game from your fourth guard, who was a top four pick and a loaded draft. Put Crowder into Hayward. You know, the kid who would help the, the Celtics the most on paper is this kid, Jonathan Isaac from Florida State, freshman. He's uh, 6'11. He rebounds, he jumps. He's like a classic. You know, energy, long energy guy, which is what they I, need. Like you saw in the Celtics series, like the guy they don't have, the six eleven guy who's just running in and playing above the rim. I so. watched uh, Florida State in the NCAA tournament and was wholly underwhelmed by them. Yeah, well, he might be the sixth pick, so I, I don't think it's going to matter. The Celtics, okay. the Celtics can't drop lower than four. The big moment today will be if nobody moves. And we get to that fourth envelope, or we get to the fourth or fifth envelope, and that Lakers logo comes up. All bets are off. Because that Lakers logo comes off. Oh, the, the, fart the, oh the fart ball. Oh, the fart ball. If the fart ball comes up five for the Lakers, <laughs> that's it. The, uh, anyway, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be amazing. Magic, whatever face Magic makes, good or bad, it's going to be a gift for the next 20 years. If they win, he's going to have the biggest Magic Johnson smile of all time. If they lose, he'll have the it's okay, it's okay Magic Johnson smile. It's going to be tremendous. The Celtics had a, a lot of trouble trying to figure out that. I, they, you made they, the right call. It's a shame that Billy King couldn't be convinced. Well, they, you know, they've, they've been to a lot of lotteries and they've been unlucky with different people. And they, they, uh, they actually wanted Paul Pierce to go. But he was working for, uh, for ESPN, mm. for the Western Finals. Who are they they're sending? Send. They're sending the owner, Wick Grossback. Oh, yeah, the right I saw that. Yeah. I, I would have sent David Ortiz. That's a pretty good one. Yeah, it's pretty good. He's just with that big, happy smile on his face. We'd have worn the World Series thing. I just would have felt more confident if he's sitting there representing us. But, uh, yeah. Well, and the PED has got to help, too. I didn't appreciate that at all. <laughs> uh, all right, we're wrapping up. Thanks to CreditWise from Capital One. It's a free app that lets you track the factors that make up your credit health using information from your TransUnion credit report. You can check it anytime without negatively impacting your credit. Download CreditWise today. Thanks to theblacktux.com. They'll help you create your look or choose from tons of styles like the office starting at $95. After ordering, your suit will arrive 14 days before your event. Try it on. Make sure everything fits. If it's best and perfect. Black Tux will send you a free replacement right away to get started now. Visit theblacktux.com slash BS. Get $20 off the purchase again. That's theblacktux.com slash BS. Don't forget about Larry Wilmore's new podcast, Black on the Air. Don't forget about Cousin Sal's new podcast, Against All Odds. Jimmy Kimmel coming on that podcast this week. Don't forget about House's podcast. What's the name of that podcast, House? The Check House. 
little bit of a quiet period in golf right now, but we have a great show coming up in about 10 days. I'm not going to yeah. uh, uh, reveal who the guest is going to be, but we'll be talking about the Memorial, and we just finished the Players' Championship. Um, the course won the championship. I think the 17th hole on Sawgrass is my favorite non-Augusta hole in any, in, in any course. I played it I in March. played all day. I, I hit two balls in the water. I it's, made a seven. It's the iconic video game course of all time in the 90s. Oh, sure. I think it was called PGA Tour 93 or 94, one of those. Sawgrass, that was it. Time to nut up on 17. I've never been <laughs> a hole quite like that. Uh, don't forget to check out the ringer.com. My new lottery karma power rankings are up. Read that there. You can also read the column I wrote about Isaiah and LeBron from a few days ago. Joe House. Yeah. Um, I, people were worried our friendship would survive, which made both of us laugh. But yeah, well, I'm, we're, I'm I owe you a big meal together. now. I mean, obviously, we're gonna we're gonna break bread and, and get all good again. Yeah, you do owe me a big meal. That's all right. We'll we'll get, we'll get it done at some point. Thanks for coming on. I'll talk to you. All right.